What's up, everybody? It's the Roundtable Sports Podcast. My name is Taylor McLean, coming to you with another Football Monday. And uh, we've hit double digits with our weeks now, and it does mean that football will eventually come to an end, and I'm certainly sad about that. But I am enjoying this so much. I'm not sure that there's anything that could bring me down. The Cowboys lost. I lost a fantasy matchup by seven yards that I shouldn't have. I mean, it's a scenario that I should feel down, but I don't because I'm getting to watch incredible football as I rewatch these games and it's exciting and fun and I'm, I just c- can't get enough. I've already watched fo- rewatched four of the games. I plan to rewatch the rest of them, including Monday night football tonight. So consider me a journal in charge to this point before we get into the football once again, we have been sponsored. Evergreen Power Solutions has stepped in and said, hey, Taylor, you don't have to do this for free anymore. You're in with us. So please support me and support them by giving them a call. The number is 214-444-9816. This is only for my Texas listeners, unfortunately, They want to go in there, help you out with your power, find you the lowest rate you can get right now, help you get in the right contract situation. And then as you go along, they're going to go back in, renegotiate your rate to a lower rate if available. And if it's not, your rates don't go up. So you're locking yourself into a situation where you're not going to have and not going to be a part of higher prices going forward with your energy bills. That's something that's big for me. I would let the contract go and then I'd end up paying variable rates and they just have me over a pit at that point. I will no longer have that problem with Evergreen Power Solutions. Once again, that's 214-444-9816. Tell them that the Roundtable Sports Podcast and Taylor McLean sent you now onto some football. And of course, first thing off the bat, what an incredible game between the Minnesota Vikings and the Buffalo Bills. And it wasn't just that game. There were a bunch of good games that were competitive. The Lions and the Bears were very competitive. Packers and Cowboys went to overtime. Niners Chargers felt close. Even the New York Giants and Houston Texans felt close. There was was some big games there, definitely some fun stuff to watch. But Minnesota and the Bills was clearly ahead above the rest And while I think both teams are playoff teams, we're going to see them again, maybe not against each other again, but we're going to see these teams in the playoffs at this point. So taking a whole bunch away from this game would probably be foolhardy. It's just a regular season game and the like, but it was a lot of fun. And I definitely had some notes on the game that I thought we should go through. First off, obviously, 8-1 and one by the Vikings is pretty miraculous at this point. Two weeks in a row that we've they've had to kind of pull a victory from defeat. And, of course, they're going against the Cowboys next week, so that may be a three-peat as far as close games that we're about to see from these guys. On the Minnesota side, I think this team earned a lot of people's respect today. I know that they wouldn't have even been in the game had they not gotten that fumble towards the end of regulation with Josh Allen, not getting the snap and Eric Kendricks getting the touchdown at the very end. I know they shouldn't have been in the game without a pretty miraculous play, but they made big plays to get themselves to that point and keep themselves in the game throughout the game. So they should be lauded even if, It wasn't exactly a dominating win. And it's unexpected for a Vikings team that didn't run the ball all that well. 25 for 147, averaging 5.9, isn't that bad. But you throw in the fact that Kirk Cousins got 12 of those yards and Dalvin Cook had the 81-yard big-time touchdown rush, which was pretty key to them staying close to the Buffalo Bills. and. You don't have much much of a rush at all. Obviously, 81 yards can really beef up a, an average carry there. So to have that be the case where they weren't able to rely on the run as much and they had to rely on Kirk Cousins making plays down the field, it's an especially impressive endeavor by Kirk and the Vikings to have done that. 
the Buffalo Bills were doing a good job of rushing the passer and getting to Kirk Cousins at times too. But O'Connell was able to keep them off of him a good deal as well, relying on the play action and having open throws that Kirk could make in addition to some contested throws as well. I do want to say that, you know, I don't want to give Kirk too much credit on those con- contested throws because Justin Jefferson deserves a great deal of the credit for those. I saw a stat from Next Gen Stats that he had nine catches that were less than 50% to be caught that means a guy's on top of him a guy's right in his face or well within his catch radius and justin is still going up making the catch making the toe tap whatever it was needed of him in this game and it has increased the confidence of kirk cousins a good deal as well you can see that he is having an easier time creating from the pocket than he has in other seasons and part of that is he, he has been leaning on Jeff, Justin Jefferson pretty thoroughly throughout those moments, and, and Justin's been coming through. Double J is a number one wide receiver, obviously, but it's because he is so good in all phases of the, of the game, whether it be the contested side of it or the route running, getting separation. He does a great job of doing so in all the different routes that he runs. And you can't really jam him because of his size, but he's fast enough where speed guys aren't going to be able to handle him either. It literally takes double teams to take him out of the game for the most part. There are very few cornerbacks that are able to accomplish that. Like Trayvon Diggs next week versus the Cowboys. I don't want him one-on-one with Justin Jefferson. And I'm a Cowboys fan. I I don't want that in my life because I don't think that he can handle it. And we'll talk about the Cowboys next uh, with what they can handle through the air, but still it's uh, one of the more domineering performances that I've ever seen. And it still took a ton of luck and, and what, and gumption by the Minnesota Vikings to get this done, no doubt. But Justin Jefferson was the biggest cog in that machine. Dalvin still has his moments, no doubt. And that 81 yard run to get everything going was big too, but, It's kind of shifted a bit under this offense that they don't have to rely on Dalvin in the running game as much as they have in the past. They can actually be that more balanced Ram style offense that we've seen before to this point. It's been pretty refreshing to see that come to fruition and that Kirk has been able to make that work and show more than he showed in years past. I still don't know when it comes down to it every time that he's going to be able to make that drive and it did seem like the throws he was making were within the flow of the offense. And that's been an easier thing for him when the offense is more coherent than it's been at the past. It'll be a question of can teams get him out of that? Can they shut down the the first read? Can they get him in a situation where he has to run, create, and think outside of the play? Because that's where Kirk kind of gets a little bit outside the rails. When everything's kind of within the the scope of the play, he makes accurate throws and he's able to deliver the ball on time. So you have to fluster him. You have to get him off his mark. And Buffalo, to my surprise, didn't do that as much as I thought they would. They still got to him. And I thought that they ended the game with a Von Miller sack at one one point as well. So there was definitely points where I felt like the game was over. It was actually four different times during that last little sequence where I was like, oh, well, the game's over. Great. Because I had actually texted a group a group chat of pretty much all Minnesota fans at the wrong time. They hadn't said anything all day, and I told them they were being awful quiet, and then it seemed like the, the Vikings fell apart at that moment at that time. So to see them come back and pull it out and get the win, even after giving up the field goal, after getting the miraculous touchdown, to see them win is is highly impressive and it wasn't just Kirk and Justin obviously they had a huge part to do with it Justin made some incredible throws including the one-handed catch that was huge fourth and 18 if they don't get it the game's essentially over and they get that then Thielen makes a play then Justin makes another play to get them all the way down there it was it was something to watch no doubt and he's he's uh been breaking out in a big way in front of our eyes It hasn't always been perfect. He got taken away a couple of games, but 
Minnesota has really found themselves in these moments. Yeah, they probably are going to lose one of those games at some point, and hopefully it's not at the biggest moment. But as I said, I was super relieved because of my text message, and uh, I was interested that they keep doing this and Kirk keeps showing us stuff during uh, these bigger moments because in the past it hasn't been there. Maybe it's Justin, and maybe he's breaking him out of some things where he's willing to go to those first reads because it's Justin Jefferson more and it's working out, but I got to give it to him. He, he, as much as I've disparaged him in the past that he might not be able to make those plays. He made a bunch of them today and has been making them somewhat recently. And as I said last week, he's got all types of skill position players around him. He's got Hawkinson now who seems to fit in perfectly, you know, and work the seams while Justin and Adam Thielen work the outside. He's got Dalvin behind him. He's got a better offensive scheme behind him. So literally everything's moving in the right direction. I still believe it's going to come down to Kirk Cousins in the end. So we'll see if he's able to take that next step because there's been this chasm between him and the elite quarterbacks because he hasn't been able to play make when he needs to win the games on the line, but showed me a lot today. And I, I was very impressed. I would be very upset with myself also if I glossed over the defensive performance by the Minnesota Vikings as well. They bend, no doubt, and Buffalo was able to move the ball in chunks when they wanted to at times and, and, and the like, but Minnesota does have a pretty good defense overall. It's not great. It's not the Baltimore Ravens of old by, by any means. However, it's much improved on last year, and I don't think it's 100% based on the scheme, although the scheme seems just fine they just have more playmakers at every level like getting daniel hunter back and then putting zadarius smith on the other side of that gives them a pretty solid pass rush and then adding jordan hicks on top of eric kendricks now you've got solid linebackers in the middle levels and then you've got pat pete you've got harrison smith on the backside. pat pete made two big plays and of course had the chains on after the game So while they might not be dominant, they're good on both sides of the ball, and that's going to get you some wins. But uh, it's now to that point with the Vikings where it's uh, playoff wins that we need to see now because we've seen the regular season wins, we've seen the miraculous stuff, and they've been pulling these out. But it'll be what do they pull out when it comes playoff time, and is Kirk able to perform in those moments too? He's got Justin Jefferson. If he's on the field healthy, then it's more likely than it would be without him. On the other side, I don't think that anybody in Buffalo should panic to this point. Josh didn't seem particularly sharp. Like, he wasn't at his best best, but he also wasn't playing the fool out there either. He was still ripping fastballs. He was still getting the ball out on time and putting it on his receivers for the most part. There was just some misses that he had throughout the game, especially – the two interceptions were kind of underthrown and of course untimely as well, having them both be red zone. I, I think the f- last one was in the red zone. I can't remember exactly the yardage, but you get the point. He's had about four of those in the last two games. And those are mistakes you just can't make, especially when you're Josh Allen and you're so big and strong and can just run it in anyway. That's how they got down there in the first place too. He was just running like he used to with those quarterback sweeps. It wasn't a design play or anything, but he was just getting it out out in space and lowering his head a bit and getting those extra yards and getting them down there in a position to make a play anyway. I don't want to see that all the time, but he was pulling it out in those uh, moments. And especially when you get down by the goal line, that's where it's important in the because the field shrinks and it's harder to fit it into those creases. He usually does. And honestly, the Buffalo Bills usually have a stretch like this where they go a little cold and they're still trying to figure things out. And uh, they typically do. Now, they used to have Brian Dable, who has clearly shown himself to be a master figure outer of what to do on offense because he's getting so much out of what has been a defunct quarterback to this point and a roster that doesn't really have a whole ton of pop behind their higher price guys. So maybe that's a factor for Buffalo going forward, but I, I like what I'm seeing. And, and, you know, we're one kind of fluky fumble away from us not talking about this in the same manner as at all. As a matter of fact, like I said, I thought this game 
was over like six different times, literally. Like I, I went through as I was rewatching because I remembered the feeling as I watched it the first time. I was like, hey, this game was over. And then we still have more time. Buffalo kicks the field goal to tie it, et cetera. But it's not like the vibe is off for buff for Buffalo to me. It's just that the vibes have been so strong, especially in these last couple of weeks for the Vikings. So while I'm not happy if I'm Buffalo and I lost that game, like I said, Josh was still ripping fastballs. He just made a couple of throws, a couple of under throws. They say at times that, you know, you don't get as much on the ball as you normally would with this energy. Like the pain comes through mid throw or whatever, and you kind of lose a little bit of the umph. That's what it's looked like. There's just, it's just been a little underthrown. There's just been balls that don't quite get there. And NFL passing is a precision, precision operation. You have to be right on the money with a lot of these throws. And just like I'm going to talk about Trevor Lawrence, I'm excited because he's making more of those throws to be consistent. You have to be, you have to be really anticipatory with the throws. You have to put it right on the money. And there's going to be some tight windows where you can't afford under throws like Josh has had in these last little bit. And it would make a lot of sense with what they're talking about with the injury, with the nerve in his elbow, with the UCL injury. Those are all things that would kind of lead you to those type of throws. And I'll give you that it is a little disturbing when so much of the offense is based around Josh and what he can do. He was the leading rusher by a good deal. The he A lot of times he's the leading rusher in the first place and then all the offense and all the passing is based around his ability to distribute the ball and hit guys in space with the big arm, but also with his accuracy as well. That's been the thing that had changed and taken him to the next level is that he had been really accurate to that point. And if this injury is a part of it, it wouldn't surprise me for Josh, for Buffalo. It's more about getting to the end and what teams do they need to be during playoff time? Cause I, I think regardless of this result, Minnesota's a good football team and, Buffalo is not going to have a problem pulling this together, even if they were to lose Josh Allen for a little bit of time. Like, say they rest him against a Deshaunless Browns or even the Lions. Let him get his arm back. He's got Jets, pa- Patriots, Jets, Dolphins after that. That's a little tougher, but I'm not, I'm just not overall worried. I'm not worried about him. They've got Bears, Bengals, Patriots after that. They're going to win some of those games, regardless if Josh is there or not, but we need him healthy at the very end is the big point. That's the thing we need the most because it is based on him and it is based entirely around him as it should be because he is that good and he is that dominant at times. It's just wasn't in the cards today, even though it definitely was in the cards and they, there was just a ton of luck that went against him. So we're not panicking if we're Buffalo, not great that we couldn't run the ball the way we liked. not great that we lost this game that had in hand, no doubt, but, There'll be others, and uh, I think that Josh is going to be okay based on what I saw, so we're okay. I'm also not panicking if I'm the Dallas Cowboys either. Obviously, that was the other that, that was the next game that I watched right off the bat, and which was painful as I, I felt like the Cowboys probably should have won this game and just kind of fell apart at a certain point, but certainly it was a fun watch regardless and a game we should talk about. Also, I'm sure that everybody loves to hear a Cowboys fan suffer. So I'll try to really make it sound good so that you can enjoy it. You know, you're expecting to win a game after a team that come off of five straight losses, two of which to teams that you've beaten before. Actually, I'm sorry, three of them. I forgot we beat the Lions as well. So to come out there, lose this game is especially shocking for Cowboys fans. It did highlight a weakness in the Cowboys that was interesting and that we've known about for some time. And of course, we're talking about another game where it came down to fourth down in overtime and we and it didn't quite work out. So um, once again, I'm not going to overreact to this game and the Cowboys probably win it, you know, six or seven times out of 10. But there was a big weakness re-explored by the Green Bay Packers, and that was the run game. You know, Odigizua, as well as Gallimore, are decent to good. I think they're good players that are above replacement level, no doubt. However, 
they don't really offer that same run stuffing type Vita Vea type guy that the Cowboys kind of need. They offer upside from the rush aspect of it, and they do move around really well on the line, getting into open spaces and the like. I'm good with all of that, but they don't really hold up quite as well when a team has the ability to run right at the Cowboys. And we saw it in the playoffs last year, granted a little different team, but still kind of set up the same way. And we definitely saw it today with the Green Bay Packers. Both Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon were breaking off big runs. The Cowboys would intermittently get in the backfield and make stops, which is one of their calling cards, especially with a playmaker like Micah out there. But it just seemed like throughout the game, the Cowboys had to give more and more and more credence to the run game and had to commit more and more resources to stopping the run and that put them in man coverage down the field and up until this point that had been fine against the Green Bay Packers because Christian Watson really hadn't done anything and hadn't shown consistent hands to this point however the Cowboys let him get open enough where he didn't have to worry as much about the guys around him and he made those catches that really burned the Cowboys going down the field It seemed like because the Cowboys were so into the run and so quick to go after the play action that every crossing route was open and they were able to make big plays off of that, including the Alan Lazard play to get Green Bay into field goal position in the first place. Of course, it had been interesting to see if the Cowboys could have held the Green Bay Packers to a field goal, but the Cowboys kind of went for it as they have been throughout the season. They made the fourth down plays earlier in the game, so to think that they might make this play would have made a lot of sense. Honestly, it shouldn't have come to that in the first place, and this is going to this is gonna sound like extremely sour Cowboys grapes, but CeeDee Lamb was held on the third down right before that. You could clearly see it on the replay, and it wasn't called, but that does highlight a, a problem for the Cowboys overall on the outsides in that Noah Brown is still not a second wide receiver. And Michael Gallup, as much as he's paid, probably isn't either. Because at times Green Bay was able to stick Jair Alexander on CeeDee Lamb, and CeeDee Lamb got loose and got open during some of those times. But overall, the Cowboys lack a true number one or number two or 1A, if you will, type option. Because CeeDee isn't always going to win. And he needs somebody on the other side of him to take away coverage and to spread people out against the Cowboys. This is going to sound like an entirely homer call of mine as well, but I think the Cowboys need to shell out for Odell Beckham. Cowboys still have salary cap space under this year's cap that they could use. Seems like the reports are Odell wants a ton of money, which is not surprising. But why couldn't the Cowboys pay him a million dollars per game for the rest of the season, give him about seven, I guess that'd be eight million or so, and then give him bonus money, give him another million for every game that the Cowboys win from there on out, going to the Super Bowl. If you win the Super Bowl, who cares about that point at that at that time anyway? And then you didn't have to pay out that money. I just I just think it's something that the Cowboys need overall. And I think that would do a lot to give Dak Prescott that same type of presence that Justin Jefferson has been for Kirk Cousins because while CeeDee Lamb wins a lot of matchups and makes a lot of explosive plays, I don't think he's a a typical number one in that his sizing makes it a little bit easier to take him away on a given play. And then when it comes down to that nut cut play, like it did in this last one, you don't have that number one guy to go to. Odell's coming off an ACL tear and didn't look like quite himself with the, when he was with the Rams, but he looked like a reasonable enough version where I feel like if he comes back and is 90% of what he was with the Rams, which was 90% to 95% of what he was before that, then I think that can be a valuable thing for the Cowboys. And I think whoever, whatever team he lands on, he was bringing it with the Rams last year. And when you had Cooper cup, and Odell on either side, it was hard for the defense to, you know, scheme one way or another, whereas they can kind of scheme towards CD 
right now because you're not as worried about Dalton Schultz or Michael Gallup housing one on you, whereas you might have to worry about that with Odell. Plus, Odell is extremely good in this. Sh- it's not just the short game with him as well. He's extremely good in the you know possession game as well, and Dak needs that in his receivers as well as the ability to go deep. So I think Odell would be a big fit for them. Cowboys are just trying to kick their cow their cap space down the line. You can do that in the NFL and the in the NBA that if you have cap space, that money goes to your existing players. If you have it in the NFL, that cap money goes to the next year. And Cowboys have Dak on the cap for 19 million this year and like 49 million next year. So they're going to have to find some money. And I think they're counting on this extra money they have right now to be that. But obviously any fan is going to want them to go for it and worry about next year, next year. So that's where my rational side comes in is, Hey, we need to have a team next year, but I think Odell is needed. If the Cowboys are really going to be serious about this even if they do have him, would they be able to get by the Eagles? I'm not sure because they couldn't get by the Packers today because of the way that their offense is set up against our defense. And this is not to say that this was just a big Cowboys fault, you know, missed it on fourth down, should have won this game, you know, take either. The Packers played really well and played against the Cowboys' strength. Being able to run the ball takes the pass rush out of the equation and hurts your coverage overall because you're not rushing the passer as effectively either when they're able to do that you're putting more recent into the game to stop the run and you're not getting that much as extra as far as the pass rush goes when they do have an opportunity to pass rush and then you're more and more worried about the run that opens up the play action even harder and the cowboys paid they were in man coverage and the crossing routes they had enough time because of the play action and because of Rodgers just standing in there and making throws at times to get the ball off and make these big plays that they hadn't been making until they started playing the Cowboys. So good for the Packers for pulling it together. And it probably saved their season to a good degree to get this win because it does kind of put them towards the end of the, of the chase being four and six versus being three and six. But I'm still not panicking and I'm still not excited either way because it still took everything that the Green Bay Packers had to get this win. Christian Watson has been really inconsistent to this point. Looks great today, but I'm not sure that he's going to get the same type of separation from every defense either. Green Bay has a pretty interesting stretch coming up too: Titans, Eagles, Bears, Rams, Dolphins, Vikings, Lions to end the season here. Obviously, the Lions, Bears, and Rams are one thing. Bears have been playing a lot tougher, and Rams may have Matthew Stafford by, back by them. But that's we're going to find out if Green Bay is for real or not during that stretch. I think this win would say they are. It takes a little time for rookies to find themselves. If they're able to do that and get through this stretch, then they'll have earned their way to a playoff berth at this point because – Vikings, Dolphins, Eagles, Titans. Those are all looking like playoffs teams in four of your seven games. And two out of the other three are division games, which are usually pretty tough. But regardless, he owned Aaron Rodgers owns the Cowboys again. And I can't shake that feeling because we've been feeling it from him for some time. And I still think about the Dez catch and the, Jared Cook catch on the sideline and all those things. And this is just another one of those things that has uh, put us back in that spot. And now we kind of know uh, how the bears feel, I guess, because uh, apparently he, he, he owns the bears as he's told us before. The next game that I watched was the Jacksonville Jaguars take on the Kansas city chiefs. The chiefs of course pulled this game out. No problem. It didn't have some of the overtime qualities or didn't really feel all that close throughout the game, despite the Jacksonville Jaguars getting an onside kick to start the game, which was a ballsy call for sure. And they got a pick in the red zone to start the game on top of that when they couldn't capitalize on the onside kick at first either. But to their credit, they played Kansas City hard and 
I felt like they gave it a really solid effort. In the end, they don't have the secondary to keep up with Patrick and the wide receivers that they're able to put out out on the field at this time. And of course, Patrick is at the peak of his powers at this point in his career. He's healthy and he's running around out there like he doesn't have a care in the world. And it's great to see for him because it makes him extremely dangerous when teams have to worry about him on the ground in addition to the air. Now, the good news is he didn't have to lead the team in rushing this week. He was one of five quarterbacks to do that last week. But still, that's one of the things that you have to do to try and beat Patrick is take take his legs away from him. You saw the Bills spy him at times in their game, and I saw it a little bit here, but, but Patrick was still able to get his there. And then, of course, he was throwing it all around the field to all types of different receivers. Nine guys had receptions for Patrick in this game. Now, part of that was that Juju Smith-Schuster took a horrific hit in this game. It was really bad. He had the hands, you know, you could tell that neurologically that his hands were bent up and pulled up towards his head when it happened. We've seen this already once this season with Tua Tungavailoa. So my thought process is we're it was vicious enough that we're not going to see Juju next week. And they have enough wide receivers to get by without him, but he had really been looking good for them. And Patrick had come to rely on him a bit. So I doubt we see him for Sunday night football against the chargers next week that I believe that game got flexed into that spot. And after watching the chargers yesterday play as well as they did, I think that's going to be a really good matchup for everybody to be able to single out and get their eyes on. But my point being, I think we'll see it without Juju Smith-Schuster, which is unfortunate because, like I said, he had really developed a rapport together. The good thing is that Patrick found a new target, and they have slowly been able to phase him in in Kadarius Tony. And from the first looks at Kadarius he looks like what we were expecting Sky Moore to be in this offense. He probably isn't as straight line fast as Miko Hardman. Like if they ran a hundred yard dash, Miko would probably win pretty handily, but he's close enough where he's dangerous in the deep parts of the field. And he has a lot more short area, quick twitch to his game and a lot more shiftiness to his game than Miko could bring to it. And really even Marquez Valdez Scantling, he's just a different type of receiver. And as I stated, that was kind of my expectations for what Sky Moore would be in this offense. It doesn't look like Sky Moore is quite as ready to contribute at this point. And also to my point, Kadarius Tony is six foot one ninety three, and he moves like one of those type guys with when at, whereas Sky Moore 5'10, 195, still not bad size, but not quite the size that Kadarius is able to offer or Miko. So he's a little bit more substantial. He's going to be able to use a little bit more strength with his game and, and be able to fight through more arm tackles than they do. And then you throw in this short area, quick twitch movement that he has that they don't have. And that's a really good weapon for Patrick and Andy Reid to have in their arsenal. So to see him get a bigger opportunity with Juju out of there was very encouraging for them. And I don't think it's a situation where you have to play one or the other because having both of them out there would be advantageous for him. And really, I think Juju and Kadarius have the size to be out there together as well. I don't think that Kadarius has to be in the slot or has to be in spots that Juju would be in. So to have Kadarius, Juju, and Valdez Scantling, and then be able to run Sky Moore and Miko out of those other spots and be able to rotate them in as needed is pretty dangerous. Oh, yeah. And then you also have Travis Kelsey out there. And honestly, I don't want to leave out the fact that Noah Gray has looked really good for them as well. So The weapons are all out there on the field for Kansas City. And then I mentioned earlier 
that Patrick didn't have to be the leader in rushing yards for the team because I, Isaiah Pacheco got 16 carries and did something with them. Wasn't exactly a barn burner of a performance at 82 yards and no touchdowns, but he was getting more than what was blocked for him a bit. And I enjoy the speed and, and the amount of fight that he runs with. And you pair that with everything that Patrick's able to do, give Kadarius Tony a couple of catches. And then Jarek McKinnon is also dangerous out of the backfield, especially when it comes to catching the ball. And that's kind of phased out Clyde Edwards Alaire a, a bit. Clyde Edwards Alaire didn't have a carry and had two targets in the game. So not exactly the fantasy performance we were expecting from him either, but it's because Isaiah Pacheco, they've, they've pretty much given the, the job over to him at this point. And honestly, he's the better and more decisive runner. He's more downhill. And honestly, for Kansas City, a team that is you know going to have holes for you to run in because of everything else they can do and because of the, the gravity of Patrick being able to throw the ball down the field. You just need to get the yards that are blocked for you. You need to hit the hole. And it always felt like Clyde Edwards Lair was dancing around a little bit too much. So I believe that's why they, that what they've seen. And that's why they've kind of phased him out a little bit more than uh, I, even I would have expected. So that's definitely something to watch. I'd be picking up Kadarius Tony. I'd be picking up Isaiah Pacheco because there's going to be some more goal line carries for Pacheco, even though they like to put the ball in Patrick's hands for most of the goal line situations, which is what they should do. You're going to fall into a couple of touchdowns with the Kansas City Chiefs. It's hard to say if they'll put Clyde Edwards there or give him more run. It'd be smart if they did just to make sure Pacheco's there for the playoffs. But still, it's very encouraging overall to see everything coming together, even with Juju being out. The, the weapons are there. And uh, it does seem like they might lack an alpha weapon at times. So that is something we want to look at. But throwing Kadarius Tony into the mix definitely makes me feel better about the whole thing because he does have some of that Tyreek to him, some of that dog. It's not the same speed profile at all, but there's still some of that to his game for sure. On the Jacksonville side, this was a, a plucky effort by them. And I don't mean plucky. I mean, in a bad way. I mean, fierce. I mean that they, they did what they could in this scenario. They simply don't have the same amount of talent around Trevor and around Travis Etienne and around some of their better players. Like they have dogs. Like I like Josh Allen and I like Walker and, and there's some people on defense that I like, but there's a big disparity in their secondary overall. And Henderson not working out from a couple of drafts ago was part of that for sure. Because when you draft a top 10 cornerback, you're expecting them to be a top 10 cornerback. And he simply hasn't been that guy, regardless of, you know, the regime. And having the regime last year definitely set this team back a little bit. And then when you're considering that they're still trying to fill the holes of the team from some deficits when they just didn't have the same amount of draft decision maker in the past. I mean, the Tom Coughlin era got them to the playoffs for a bit, but also I think in the end cost them a bit too. Like this team looks a lot different with Jalen Ramsey on it, looking studly. And then you're not having to overpay free agents to come in and get your cap sheet out of whack. The amount of money they've had to pay for Christian Kirk and Zay Jones is a little outrageous compared to the production that you're getting from them but I can't even imagine what they look like without them either I think they're quality players it's just you had to pay a little bit more than what you probably would have had to have paid if they were homegrown talent that you could lock up later and that's why you don't want your team to be the big offseason winner usually because that means that you're having to pay for people that other teams let go and other teams are locking up their studs typically stu or their franchise tagging them if they're, they're really, really worth it. So that's an issue for Jacksonville overall. And I don't mean to get extremely negative just right out of the bat because I really liked the effort that they play with and everything does seem to be moving in the right direction. It's hard to say that with three and seven, but you think about they were the number one pick before 
And it makes a little bit more sense and it's a little bit more commensurate with what you might think for this team. I think everybody has higher expectations for the team overall than they normally would with Trevor being a number one overall pick. But as I said, we're trying to draft our way and free agent our way out of a crater of talent because we traded that town away for assets and we didn't have good drafts and we had a, a crappy regime before with urban Meyer. But now I feel like we have a good one, like converting those fourth downs that Trevor converted, which is big for him overall, the onside kick, the, the cohesiveness of the offensive scheme overall, it all looks different now. And it all feels like it's moving in a positive direction, including Trevor Lawrence. So you throw in having a competent scheme, having a competent regime that you can draft towards and build on. Trevor being in the same system for more than one year will mean a ton for his development and his confidence overall. And when you have that confidence in your scheme and the players around you, then you can you know kind of experiment and grow and get better at making those big time throws that Patrick makes now that Trevor is going to need to make later on. And he's making more of those throws this year than he was last year. The throws are more on time. The speed of the game, is it seems like he's caught up to that part of it. And now it's just getting the experience dealing with these different defensive you know, looks, being able to recognize those looks, being able to look off the secondary to get your guy open, all those next steps that he needs to take he's taking some of those incrementally there's still times where he's missing throws no doubt about it and part of that is the personnel but it's not all it's it's a big part of it is trevor is just a little behind or it's not right on time or whatever it is but i can tell you that that's the way it goes for second year quarterbacks you just want to see more flashes you want to see more consistency and you don't want to see him look overwhelmed quite so often as he did last year. And I'm seeing all of those things. The throws are progressing. So it's exciting. And it's especially exciting when Jacksonville was a little overmatched. The offensive line had trouble getting Etienne in the running game going. I mean, they ran for 75 yards. And that's only because Trevor Lawrence had 26 of them. So that was a big problem. ETN had been crushing it and they had been giving him big run lanes and better blocking to that point. And then they were giving up pressure as well. Five sacks is a ton. And honestly, sometimes the sack numbers don't really express how under duress he was, but it does feel like he was, it was a five sack game. That actually feels pretty appropriate. The only reason it wasn't more and the only reason it was for just 19 yards is because Trevor was running a lot more effectively today and seemed to realize more today than he had in other games that he needed to run to help his team, which is a very positive development as well. That was something that was missing earlier on. And I think there was a little bit of a, a switch flip for Trevor in those moments because he, he was letting it go and he has the speed to do so. It's scary but it's a tightrope that all these quarterbacks need to walk. It's getting the yards, threatening the defense, making them worry about you without going overboard and getting yourself hit. And that's not easy for any quarterback, especially a rookie quarterback. So I was encouraged to see Trevor do a little bit more of the running in this game for sure. So do they have work to do on their roster and the like? Absolutely they do. They need a new right tackle. I don't like Cam Taylor. I don't care how good he run blocks. He's a, he's a sieve in the pass blocking portion of it, and they're going to need that part of this game. More importantly, though, they're probably going to need secondary pieces. The secondary is not good at this point. Um, I like Cisco, and I like the safeties all right. I don't know. Just overall, they need more secondary pieces. And then they have Calvin Ridley coming, and I think that's going to help a lot but I still think they need a big wide receiver. Trevor needs somebody he can throw it up to. And Marvin Jones is good, but he's lost a little bit as far as the step goes. And he's still not big. Like he needs a, Trevor needs a big guy. Um, but 
don't all teams need a big guy that can run and has solid hands. So there you go. The final game that we'll finish up with, uh, not exactly a glamour game with the Indianapolis Colts and the Las Vegas Raiders. I watched this game last night after all the game all the games. So I was a little out of it, but I still was able to catch the gist of what we had going on here. It was extremely interesting to see them pivot to Matt Ryan after the previous regime had said Sam Ellinger was their starter. Let me tell you that Sam Ellinger might not be a backup quarterback. He might not be one of the 60 best quarterbacks in the world at this time from what I had seen. So to see them make this pivot is definitely a positive sign for their overall development as a coaching staff. Who knows if this coaching staff is actually long for this world. Hiring Jeff Saturday out of the blue off of the announcer desk, or I think he was an in-studio guy, is uh, crazy. And hardly ever have we seen something like that before, especially in season. I totally get that, that that he's their guy and that he's very articulate and smart. And I love that he's a center and an offensive lineman and that he's getting a chance because I played center in high school. So I'm, I'm a big fan. I thought for sure that Saturday and Ellinger were an intact like tank move situation, but rightly so they could tell from what they had seen that this wasn't working out. Sam, I guess lost a bunch of weight trying to be faster, but it did not, or or I'm really unsure what the actual thought process was behind that, but it made him lose any physicality that he would have had between the tackles. And he still doesn't look fast. Like we just talked about Trevor Lawrence and Pat Patrick Mahomes. They're not, you know, going to be cornerbacks or anything, but they have an extra gear compared to Sam Ellinger. So if Patrick runs a four, seven or something along those lines, I think maybe it's a four, six or something, then Sam's out there running a five. It looked like by comparison, it just looked bad. And if he's not bringing anything to the run game from hit with his legs, then that's a huge problem. Jonathan Taylor or not. Jonathan Taylor obviously was another addition that made a huge difference for the team, getting those extra yards giving the team a little bit more identity to be able to build itself around really made a difference outside of Max Crosby though. It's not like the Raiders really have a great defensive line or a great defensive front. So having the Colts offensive line, be able to handle them and and be able to open up running lanes, kind of opened everything else up for the Colts in this game, regardless of all that, regardless of Jonathan Taylor coming back and making them look a lot better it was still a solid decision for Jeff Saturday and the team. And it shows me that they're not 100% tanking because if you were, you could have just left Sam out there and lost this game for sure. So kudos to, for that, to them for not taking that route and to try and actually see what they have in this team and what they have in Jeff Saturday, at least for one game, because every team kind of, at one point or another, when they have a coach fired, they have this extra bump in effort to prove that it wasn't them, it was the coach. Now, a lot of times the team is not good either, so that doesn't last for very long, but a one-game stint can be had by a team just by giving that extra punch. Everybody's got juice. Everybody's got this on a given day. That can get you a win in the NFL when if the other team doesn't have it and the Raiders at this point have kind of lost some of their oomph because of the way the season has gone for them so the fact that the Colts kind of came out with that and the Raiders didn't makes a lot of sense why this game went the way that it did and good news for the Colts fans it could not be just a one game situation it could be more than that no doubt and the fact that you brought Matt Ryan in to do that and to go for it like that and to then to see what you've got here couldn't give more credit on that Matt Ryan is 10 times the quarterback than Sam Ellinger will ever be at this stage of his career he is downgraded from what he used to be from a physical standpoint but not to the point where benching him outright for Sam ever made sense 
in anything but a pure tanking situation because it is that bad for real. I can say that with a hundred percent certainty because he just just didn't have it from a you know processing passing standpoint, and Sam didn't. And with the running being the way it was, that's that's just not the way it's going to be. It reinvigorated the offense. Michael Pittman, Paris Campbell were out there getting catches because the offense has some teeth when he's out there good for them for putting him out there let's see what it looks like next week do they have the juice still next week when they're playing the philadelphia eagles then they've got the steelers with tj watt back that was surprising to see him back out there i wasn't expecting it and then cowboys vikings chargers giants have been playing better and then finally the texans to end the season that's a brutal schedule to end it so they may end up tanking a bit and maybe end up being a higher pick just by who they're playing there. Steelers, okay, that's one thing. The rest of those teams are winning teams at this point and are going to create tough matchups for them. So let's see how they look with that. Do they fight with the same passion in those games for Jeff Saturday? If so, great. Great. He can be a head coach in this way. He doesn't, he can hire offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators to come up with the scheme and whatnot head coaching is more than that right but it's going to be tested big time in this next bit and i'm i'm not 100 percent sold just based on based on beating the raiders because the raiders are their own mess they have top end talent that's good like Devonte adams max crosby i like those guys but you look at the first round picks from this team overall and what they've done with their draft capital overall outside of Max Crosby and a couple of others. And it's really bad. Like cutting Jonathan Abrams this week kind of signifies part of that, right? That kind of shows you what they've been going through. They don't have Leatherwood anymore. You can keep going down the line. We shouldn't rehash all of them, but it's bad. So while, while it's a little disorienting when they have Derek Carr and Devontae Adams and they, they should have Waller and Jacobs and Max Crosby, the rest of the roster, the depth of the roster isn't there. And McDaniels is going to have to draft his way out of that with this regime. So I'm reserving judgment overall on the top end talent of this team. I still don't think that Derek Carr is a top end quarterback by any means. And I think Devontae is finding that out in short order while Derek is able to find him at times the the accuracy just isn't always there like he can't always fit it into that hole or where he thinks he can and he doesn't always process at a top elite level like he's not always seeing the open guy and the like so he's not that ultimate floor raiser like Aaron Rodgers was in his last stop but it's not like he's bereft of talent either he's just not he's just that tier below elite that sometimes can get you the win, but sometimes can also get you beat. And when you don't have the rest of, like you plop him into a better roster, then you're looking at something, but I don't know that ultimately he's able to drive the bus. Ultimately, I think he's more of a passenger. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, there's a difference between those two things. And it's interesting now for the Raiders because they are like second in the standings. And I said that like they're second in the league. I mean, second in the tank rankings, excuse me. There's a big difference between those two things. And uh, when you look at Tankathon, the Raiders are right there with the Houston Texans. Thing is, they locked up Derek Carr for a ton of money. So it doesn't make sense for them to ultimately tank, but they may not have a choice in the end either with the way the roster is constructed. I don't think it's a scheme thing with them. I think the scheme is okay. It's not devastating, right? If it was devastating, they'd be winning these games. I think it's all just okay, right? The offensive line is just okay. I mean, they have their left tackle in Colton, but outside of that, and and that is one other one, their left tackle is one other one for their draft record that he is good for sure. But outside of that, the offensive line has problems. Mac Hollins is your second wide receiver. There's a talent deficit there that they didn't address. There's just a lot of holes there. And then jo- then they have declined the option on Josh Jacobs, who I kind of feel like is ma- going to make them pay for it at this point. He's playing really good. I like the way that Josh Jacobs looks, and I wouldn't be trading him anytime soon. 
my my thought process that they were going to use more backs in the backfield and screw up, you know, Josh Jacobs share of the load has been out of whack. They, they use Amir Abdullah a little bit, but Josh Jacobs is so far beyond him and Zamir White when healthy. He hasn't been good about staying healthy in other years either. So that is a part of that. And that is something to monitor overall. But I can tell you that Josh Jacobs does look good at this point. One problem for Josh Jacobs as a free agent, though, is that there are a ton of running back free agents. I don't think I remember seeing this many. Saquon, of course, is the big one. They'll franchise tag him before they let him go. He'll never hit free, true free agency. If he did, he'd get paid like Zeke got paid at one point, I think. But anyway, Josh Jacobs going to be out there. Tony Pollard, free agent. As a Cowboys fan, that terrifies me a bit. Damian Harris, David Montgomery, Jeff Wilson. I know that isn't as huge a name to you, but I, I value Jeff Wilson. I think he's a quality runner. Devin Singletary, Kareem Hunt, Miles Sanders, Jamal Williams has nine touchdowns. He's going to be out there. Alexander Madison might get out from under the thumb of Dalvin Cook. There's going to be a lot of guys looking for homes. That's going to suppress the market a little bit. So maybe that maybe the Raiders can get a good number on Josh Jacobs. Maybe we'll get some good numbers on these running backs because teams haven't wanted to pay for them overall. But there's a lot of teams, I think, that could use these guys, too. So that'll be something that's something I wrote down is Josh Jacobs looks good. 3.7 doesn't really do it justice as far as his his uh, carry load there. He looks a lot better than that. And he looks a lot more complete overall with the way they're using him. Well, anyway, that's what I've got for the podcast today. Like if you're on YouTube, subscribe to the channel there. Obviously, download if you've gotten to this point and haven't done so on anything else. That's the big, big metric there. Look for there's a lot of good plays this week so look for a, a bunch of videos i'm gonna be putting those out there try and get some more long form videos out there I, I the etn video did very well and i'm excited that y'all liked that and and whatnot so we'll, we'll keep getting those out there probably gonna have like a, a ken walker and a saquon barkley video this week that's kind of what i'm thinking as far as long form videos so look for that call the sponsor evergreen power solutions if you get a chance That'll, that's a big support to the podcast. We're looking to uh, we're we're professional now. This isn't just love love of the game anymore. So give them a call so I can uh, keep putting money back into this. Probably get the production quality up. Try and get my face on the podcast. So give them a call 214-444-9816. That is only Texas power customers that they can help. But anyway, give them a call. Appreciate the time today. Have a great rest of your day.